Assalamualaikum warahmatullah and uh, very good afternoon. Uh, I am in my lecture 17 of CHM 477, Inorganic Chemistry. And this is the part of coordination compounds where I am going to cover explanation, excuse me, cover explanation of colors um, for coordination compounds using the crystal field theory. So CFT provides a very good explanation to the fact that many coordination compounds are colored. And this is a distinguishing property of compounds of transition metals and it is not possessed by the compounds of representative metals. Um, CFT highlights the effect of the d orbital energies of the metal ion as the ligands approach the metal center. Now, before discussing the theory, let us understand the causes of why a substance appears colored. Now, white light is an electromagnetic radiation consisting of all wavelengths with the wavelength of lambda in the visible range. Passing it through a glass prism can disperse it into a spectrum of colors, each with an individual range of wavelengths. This is uh, fundamental physics. Yeah? You have probably gone through some uh, experiments where you pass uh, white light through a glass prism and you get a rainbow. Um, emerging. Now, an object can absorb or reflect certain wavelength of light, resulting in what is perceived as colors in the eye of an observer. Uh, in white light, when an object appears white, when, when you see something that is colored white, it means that it reflects or it transmits all wavelengths. Yeah, it doesn't absorb anything. It gives out, gives back out, transmit, reflect all wavelength of light, uh, making that subject appear white. But when the subject or when the object appears black, it means that the object absorbs all the wavelength of the white light. So nothing is returned back and nothing is detected by our eyes, so we see that object as black. Now, a colored object, which is neither white nor black, absorbs certain wavelengths and reflects other wavelengths. The reflected light enters the eye of the observer. What is not absorbed by the compound or by the object is reflected, and that light is uh, seen by the observer and the brain perceive that as color, as a color. Now, for example, an object appears green if one of the two things happens below. Yeah, one of these two things happen. It appears green when it absorb all lights but transmit or reflect only the green component. So when uh, the, the other component of the white light is absorbed by a material and green is reflected. So what we see is the wavelength of light corresponding to green. So we see it as being green. The reflected light enters our eyes and interpreted as green. So that's one possibility that what that what might happen when you see green. The second possibility is the sub the the substrate or the subject or the object reflect all colors it reflects all colors except red i.e it absorbs red red so red has here in this uh, diagram here red has a complementary color of green so when red is absorbed when red is absorbed green is um uh is seen the complement the complementary color of red which is green will be uh 
will be seen by our eyes. That means the mixture of reflected light enters our eyes and interpreted as green. So when only the red light is absorbed by the compound, all other components are reflected and, oops, excuse me, and that reflected light appears as green, which is the complementary color of red. Now here, I'm going to explain to you uh, this chart wheel, a color wheel with appropriate wavelength. You have to be familiar with this uh, color chart. Um, visible light has the uh, wavelength between 400 nanometers all the way into 700 nanometers. Anything lower than 400 nanometers is in the ultraviolet range, which we cannot see with our eyes. And anything higher than 700 nanometers is in the infrared range, which we also cannot detect with our eyes. The only wavelength of colors that we are able to detect with our eyes is between 400 nanometers all the way until 700. Okay, so that is the first thing. Now, the second thing, you can divide the visible colors into six uh, components. You have red, you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And I always like to use the R-O-Y-G-B-V, Roig Biv, yeah? Roig Biv uh, to assist me in um, remembering this color spectra or this color spectrum. Oh. Roig beef, R-O-Y-G-B-V, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet are the colors and opposite colors are complementary colors. Red is opposite to green. So when green is absorbed, the compound will appear red. When red is absorbed, the, the object will appear green. When orange is absorbed, the compound will appear blue and vice versa when blue component is absorbed by the by the substance or by the object then the object will appear orange in our eyes and similarly with the pair of violet and yellow when yellow is absorbed yellow component is absorbed then that particular object will appear purple, but when purple is absorbed, that particular uh, uh, object is yellow. So the opposite, the opposite colors in the chart are complementary colors. Now, another thing that you must uh, uh, be aware of, you start um, in this way, if you go anti-clockwise in this chart wheel, you go from 700 to 400. So red is 700 until 650. And then lower than that will be orange until 580. Lower than that will be yellow until 560. Lower than that will be your green until 490. Blue until 430. And even lower will be your violet. So you're going to have the colors uh, in anti-clockwise manner represented from 700 for the red and going all the way to 400 nanometers for the violet. So remember R-O-Y-G-B-V, Roig Biv, Roig Biv and 700 for red and 400 for violet. So that is the trend. So this is something that it is worthy for you to remember. Now, what has been said of reflected light also applies to transmitted light. Reflected is given back or, yeah, reflected, uh, returned. But transmitted 
is slightly different from reflected. Transmitted is the light that passes through a medium. For example, if you have a, a tube, a test tube of solution, and light passes through that test tube of solution, then what goes out is not reflected, it is transmitted. But anything that is absorbed by that solution is still absorbed. So when white light goes through a solution, certain component is absorbed, and when the remaining component goes through it, that is that component is said transmitted. But when you have, for example, uh, something that is reflecting, uh, white light comes and hit your component or your object, it absorbs a certain component and it reflects uh, the remaining component. So what is said of reflected light is also true or applied for transmitted light. Now let have let's have a discussion about hydrated um, cupric ion or copper two ion. Yeah, copper sulfate is blue. I'm sure all chemistry students have seen a solution of copper sulfate, blue copper sulfate solution. Now copper sulfate, when it is dissolved in water, copper will be hydrated having six molecules of water attaching to it. The sulfate will become just the counter ion. Yeah. Now copper sulfate appears blue to our eyes because it appears blue to our eyes because the copper sulfate absorbed the orange component of the white light. So when orange component of the white light is absorbed, blue, blue will be detected by our eyes. Yeah? And the orange component has a lambda of 600 around here. Yeah? Around here. Lambda of 600. Yep. Around here. Oh. So the light in the orange region which has a lambda of 600 of the spectrum is absorbed so the solution of copper sulfate which actually is copper h2o6 in water will appear blue blue has a lambda of 450 nanometers will appear as blue in our eyes now so look at this um, table which is actually um, explaining the color chart in this way. So when orange is absorbed, absorbed color is orange, then okay, when absorbed color is orange, then observed color is blue. Yeah, Absorbing the component at 600 nanometer of the white light will leave the component of blue light to be transmitted with the wavelength of 450. When violet is absorbed, your, your um, op subject will, will appear green-yellow. When blue is absorbed, the object will be yellow and so on and so forth. So, when the energy of a photon is equal to the difference between the ground state and an excited state, now you have learned about crystal field theory, yeah? You have learned about crystal field theory, and you know in crystal field theory, the d orbitals are split. The T2g and the eg levels no longer exist at the same energy level. So you have lower energy level and you have higher energy level. So in ground state, all electrons stay where they should be. But in excited state or when uh, energy is provided, then one of the electrons at the lower energy level will be excited and jump onto the higher energy level. Yep. So, what we say as the ground state is when there are no excitation through 
energy, but when the electrons receive uh, energy from the light that is shining through it, then the electrons can be excited to go and jump up to the higher level. When, it, when electrons jump up to a higher level, absorption occurs as the photon strikes the atom or ion or the compound and an electron is promoted to a higher level. Maybe we can have a look at this. For example, here is one electron in the ground state and then it is provided with a photon of energy. So this electron with that photon of energy will have energy extra, extra energy to jump up to the excited state. So this is excited state, this is ground state. So this knowledge enables us to calculate the energy change involved in the electron transition the electron transit between the lower energy level to higher energy level. And we use the famous Planck's equation, energy equals to H nu, where H is the Planck's constant and nu is the frequency. And we also know that nu frequency is equal to C over lambda, frequency of uh, a light is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength of that light. So E is equal to H nu. So if you want to know how much energy is, um, uh, how much is the difference in energy between the uh, T2G and the EG level, you can calculate using this value. Delta is equal to H nu, whereas nu, which is the frequency, can be converted or can be obtained from this calculation, C over lambda, if you know what is lambda. So using this uh, calculation, you have nu is equal to C over lambda, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second divided by 600. Why 600? Because the absorbed light is in the orange region with the lambda of equal to 600. So you want to know how much energy is obtained by ob absorbing that lambda equals 600 nanometers. And when you do the calculation, nu will be 5 times 10 to the power of 14 here, 5 times 10 to the power of 14 through the wavelength of 600 nanometers as you calculate here. So delta, which is the splitting, is 6 times 6.63 times 10 power minus 34, which is the Planck's constant, multiplied by your frequency, which we calculate here, and you get that the splitting is 3.32 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. And that is absorbed by one ion. In one mole of ion, there are 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 um, particles. Yeah. So if you want to see... Uh, per mole, then you have to multiply it by Avogadro's constant, and uh, that will we, we will see later. Note that this energy is absorbed by one ion. So if the wavelength of the photon absorbed by an ion lies outside of the visible region, then the transmitted light will look the same to us as the incident light, which is white. So if the energy, yeah, if the photon of energy is outside of the visible region, either lower than 400 or higher than 700, then we cannot see uh, that light. Our eyes cannot detect it, so it will appear white to us. The best way to measure crystal field splitting is to use spectroscopy to determine the wavelength at which light is absorbed. Now let's take an example of 
uh, titanium with six water three plus and this is um, important because this is the simplest uh, situation where you have only one electron now titanium six water or hexa aqua titanium three plus provides a straightforward example because titanium-3 has only one 3D electron. The compound or the ion absorbs light in the visible region of the spectrum. The wavelength corresponds to the maximum absorption is 498 nanometers. So when you run uh, an ultraviolet UV vis, UV -vis spectra, a spectrum of this, what you will see is a spectrum looking like that and you're going to have a maximum here around 498 nanometers. And that 498 nanometers will allow us to calculate how much is the splitting between these two levels. Yeah, these two levels. Because you know there is only one ion, that is... Uh, present in titanium H, uh, titanium 3. So when this photon of light, which is H nu, is absorbed by this is by this electron, it gets excited to the higher energy level from T to G to E G, and that is detected through the ultraviolet and the ultraviolet UV vis spectrum will give us a maximum at the absorbed wavelength which is 498 uh, two things to note the process of photon energy absorption by electron at 2 TG exciting it and making it jump to higher level of EG and the graph of the absorption A is this A is the process of this photon of energy being absorbed by this electron to go up that way. And B, which is B here, is the absorption spectrum, which is the UV visible spectrum of titanium H2O6. The energy of the incoming photon is equal to the crystal field splitting. So if you want to know what is the crystal field splitting, you may calculate it from this lambda. So this is your lambda maximum, lambda max. The maximum absorption peak in the visible region occurs at 498 nanometers. And we can calculate that. You have uh, energy or delta is equal to HC over lambda. H is this, C is that, lambda is that, and lambda is in nanometer. You have to multiply it by 10 to the power of minus. Uh, 1 to the power of minus 9 to change it into meter because here the speed of light is in meters per second. So when you do that, you are going to get that the uh, delta energy of that splitting is 3.99 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joule and that is for one ion. So if you want to know for the whole one mole of that um, titanium H2O, you just multiply it by the Avogadro's number. To express this energy difference in a more convenient unit of kilojoule per mole, then we write delta is equal to this 3.99 times 10 minus 19 joule per ion multiplied by Avogadro's number, which is ion per mole, and you have 240 kilojoule per mole. So if you have one mole of um, titanium H2O6 undergoing this excitation, the energy is 240 kilojoule per mole. Yeah? So that is how you use uh, the information about the lambda max. This is your lambda max to calculate the uh, splitting of the d orbital, the energy of the splitting. And you can use that kind of calculation to explain the colors of transition metal compounds or coordination compounds. The wide range of colors of coordination compounds is the result of energy difference, which is delta, 
of the T2G and the EG orbitals in their complex ion. This splitting of the D orbitals is called the crystal field effect, and delta is called the crystal field splitting energy C CFSE. Yeah. Now, aided by spectroscopic data for a number of complexes, all or a number of complexes that have the same metal ions but different ligands. If you keep your metal ion constant, but you, excuse me, you change your ligands and then you run the ultra UV vis uh, spectrum of each one of that component, you are going to be able to calculate how much splitting is caused by the ligands. Yeah, because you are varying only the ligands. Now, chemists calculate the crystal field splitting of each ligand and establish what is called a spectrochemical series, which is a list of ligands arranged in increasing order of their ability to split the d orbital energy level. If the ligand is able to split it only a small amount, you put it at this end here. If the ligand is able to split the uh, orbital by a big amount, then you put it at the other end here. So, as you have seen previously when I was uh, explaining about CF crystal field theory to you, I have explained it to you that the uh, group 7 ligand will be splitting the d orbitals to the smallest degree, followed by the group 6 ligand, followed by the group 5 ligand, and then followed by the group 4 ligands. So this is the order, and the colors of the compound is observed like this, because um, the CO appears blue, that means it has absorb the color yellow and we will I will go through that with you later as we do more relationship between absorbed colors and transmitted colors and energy corresponding to that splitting. So this is the picture of some of the first row transition metals in solution. So you have titanium, chromium, manganese. You can see all these compounds are colored. Yeah. All these compounds are colored, some are intensely colored, some are lightly colored, but they are all colored. But when you have D is equal to 0, or when D is equal to 10, D10, when you have D0 and D10, meaning that in D0 case, there is no electrons to jump up and down between the split energy levels, no jumping, no colors. But D10 also, even though there are a lot of electrons in there, but everybody is full house. All the orbitals are full, so there is no possibility of the 10 electrons jumping up and down because everybody's full. They just have to sit put. So when there is no jumping of electrons from the lower energy level to higher energy levels, you do not observe any color. Yeah, they are colorless. But when you have from D1 until D9, then you see colors being observed. Now, ligands are ranked into spectrochemical series uh, with regard to their ability to split D orbitals. Strong field ligands lead to larger splitting energy, which is larger delta. Weak field ligands lead to smaller splitting energy, which is smaller, smaller delta. So here is your spectrochemical series. Yep. Like I explained at the top, you see it at the top there. Yep. Again, these are the weak field ligands getting stronger, stronger, and stronger as going to the this end. So that is at this other end is the strong field ligand. Remember, these are the absorbed energy. We're talking about absorbed energy when small. Uh, when a weak field ligand will absorb smaller, uh, will 
<laughs> small, small, excuse me, weak field ligands will produce small splitting. Small splitting means that energy absorbed is smaller. And energy, as you can see, is inversely proportional to lambda or the absorbed wavelength. So it is the longer wavelength. Small delta means longer wavelength absorbed. Large delta or large splitting means that a shorter wavelength is absorbed. Okay? Uh, when the absorbed uh, lambda is big, that means your reflected lambda must be small because if you remember the color chart, complementary, where is the color chart? Hmm. There you are. If the absorbed lambda is small, then your reflected lambda is big. If your absorbed lambda is big, then your reflected lambda is small. So this is what I mean when I say uh, small energy, big lambda absorbed, small lambda reflected. In this end, big energy splitting, small lambda is absorbed, big lambda is reflected. And this relationship is quite important when we are trying to explain the trend of colors for compounds. Yeah. Hmm. When an ion absorbs light in visible range, electrons are excited, jumping from the lower energy level, T2G, to the higher energy level, E.g., the difference between the two electronic energy levels in the ion is equal to the energy which is inversely related to the wavelength of the absorbed photon. So del uh, delta energy of the electron jumping is equal to the energy provided by the photon which is equal to H nu which is equal to Hc over lambda and it is inversely proportional. Energy is inversely proportional to lambda. Now the substance has color because only certain wavelengths of incoming white light are absorbed. The rest of the wavelength are reflected or transmitted by the substance and when they reach our eyes we interpret those wavelengths as colors uh, through our retina. So when we consider, this is a repeat of what um, I was explaining to you about titanium. When uh, a titanium H2O6, uh, it, it, is, it looks purple to our eyes. It looks purple. The color is purple. That means it has absorbed the green, yellow, a component of light. This is the whole component of the white light. Whole component of the white light. When the absorbed component is green yellow, what is transmitted or what comes out are all the other components that are not absorbed. So the combination of all these colors will make a sea purple. Yeah? Green color is absorbed. Purple is seen. Yeah. You can see in the color chart. Hmm. Yeah, yellow green is absorbed here, around here. So you see purple. You see purple. Pre predominantly yellow. Yeah? So this is the relationship. I, I put it down here so we can ex, we can ex, I can explain it to you uh, better. Yeah. Now let us test our understanding. There is a, uh, a question here to understand whether you have understood uh, to to see whether you have understood about colors. Chromium three ion forms octahedral complexes with two two neutral ligands X and Y. Remember, these are neutral ligands X and Y. 
<coughs> the color of CR-X63 plus is blue, while the color of CR-Y63 plus is yellow. The question is, which is a stronger field ligand, X or Y? Now, how do you work that out? So, that is a table that I will guide you through so you can understand the relationship better. So, the information that we obtain from the question is CRX6 3 plus is blue, which we put here. CRY6 3 plus is yellow, which we obtain here. So, blue has the wavelength of 450 nanometers. Yellow has wavelength of 580 nanometers, as you can see in this chart around there. Yeah? There. So, compar comparatively, you can say that CRX6 absorbs the shorter wavelength, whereas, I don't know, uh, CRX6 transmits, yeah, transmits the shorter wavelength because what you observe in your eyes are the transmitted color, not the absorbed colors. So, transmitted color for CRX6 is shorter than CRY6. That means your absorbed color must be longer because complementary to blue, complementary color of blue is orange. Complementary color of blue is orange. So when you see blue, that means the absorbed color is orange. When you see yellow, that means the absorbed color is violet. Yeah? So orange has a uh, lambda of 600 nanometers, wavelength of 600 nanometers. Your dark blue or your violet has a uh, wavelength of 430 nanometers. Comparatively, the absorbed color of the blue compound is longer than the absorbed color of yellow compound. And you know that absorbed energy is inversely proportional to your absorbed lambda. So, longer Absorbed color means smaller energy. Shorter absorbed color means bigger energy. So bigger energy is caused by strong field ligand. Smaller energy is caused by weak field ligand. So it's uh, it's a little, it's double it's it's like a double inversion. Yeah. So maybe you can um, to make things simpler for you to remember for transmitted colors. Shorter lambda is produced by weaker field ligand. Longer lambda is produced by stronger field ligand. So when you see a compound, when you see means transmitted, a compound which has a, a color that corresponds to a short wavelength, then you know it is produced by the ligand from the weak field ligand. When you see a compound that has a color corresponding to a longer lambda, then you have uh, the strong field ligand. So this is um, true for transmitted colors. So I have that kind of formula. Yeah. So uh, you just have to understand the whole concept so you can uh, go through a few questions later. Now, there is a sample problem here, which is ranking crystal field splitting energies for complex ion of a given metal. So you have titanium water 6, titanium ammonia 6, titanium cyanide 6. So what do you see here? You have here is um, donor atom is oxygen, which is group 6. Here your donor atom is nitrogen, which is group Five. Here your donor atom is carbon, which is group 4. So from here, you already know from our previous discussion that CN is the strong field ligand, 
water is the weak field again. But how is that explained in terms of color? So you are used, you are requested to rank the ions in terms of relative value of delta, of the energy, of the visible light absorbed. So the solution is the ligand field strand is in order of C and minus is the biggest, ammonia, and then the weakest is water. So the rel relative size of delta, because we know strong field ligands give big delta, weak field ligands give small delta. So you know that this is um, uh, absorbing short lambda transmitting long lambda. Yeah, this is absorbing short lambda, transmitting long lambda. Whereas in here, weak field ligand delta is small. So it is absorbing big lambda and transmitting small lambda. So titanium water is absorbing big lambda, transmitting small lambda. That's why you have purple. Yep, like that. So that is all about colors. So I am quite done with colors. I have uh, some exercise here that you can have a look at. I hope you uh, can go through this exercise. Uh, maybe we can go through maybe five minutes. Have a look. Problems, consider the coordination compound X and Y below. The X is manganese, 5 water, bromo, bromi, bromide, which is high spin, whereas Y is manganese, 5 water, nitro, bromide, low spin. For each complex ion, draw a fully labeled crystal field splitting diagram and determine the number of unpaired electrons. So this is really easy for you to do. You have uh because this is this is a complex ion having six ligands so you have octahedral splitting octahedral splitting having three uh, orbitals oh undo redo hmm. ah. having three orbitals at the bottom and two orbitals at the top so this is the splitting for your high spin D5 because manganese in this case, if you work it out, your manganese here is manganese 2. Similarly, this manganese is also manganese 2. So manganese 2 is argon 3D5. When you have five electrons that you need to arrange uh, in small delta, because you know water is low spin, uh, high, high spin, delta small. Yeah. So this is how you arrange five electrons in, uh, low, uh, in a high spin complex, delta small. This is how you arrange five electrons in a, uh, low spin complex, delta big. So for, High spin complex D5, you have five unpaired electrons. Low spin complex D5, you have one unpaired electrons. So you are required to draw a fully labeled crystal field splitting diagram and determine the number of unpaired electrons, which you do like this. Yep. Then you are required to state whether, because the difference here is bromide, for the high spin and nitro for the low spin. So you are required to state whether bromide and nitro are strong or weak field ligand. So you just have to say small delta, weak field ligand, big delta, strong field ligand. Strong field ligand uh, produces low spin complex. Weak field ligand produces high spin complex. Yep, that's uh, already covered in the previous lecture. Now, a question two that we can go through is when cobalt chloride is dissolved in water, a pale pink solution is obtained 
when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added in excess to the solution, the color turns an intense blue color. Upon investigation, both the pink and blue species contain three unpaired electrons each. The equation below represents the reaction that takes place. So you have pink is your cobalt six water because when cobalt is dissolved in water, it, it coordinates to six water, make it a pink solution. But when you add excess of hydrochloric acid, you have uh, removed your water and make it uh, co uh, coordinating to cl chloral, and that becomes blue. So cobalt H2O6 is pink, cobalt Cl4 is blue. So question is, write the electron configuration of cobalt ion in both cases. Obviously, to write the electron configuration, you must know what is the oxidation state. So here is cobalt 2. In here, it is still cobalt. Oh, then this is cobalt how many? Cobalt 2 also as well. Cobalt 2 as well because 4 minus plus 2 is equal to 2 minus. So in both complexes, the oxidation number of cobalt is 2 plus. So you have the electron configuration is AR3D7. You lose these two electrons first. When you lose, when you oxidize, ah, maybe I have not mentioned it to you. When you oxidize a metal, so neutral cobalt, Cobalt that is not oxidized is Ar argon 4s2 3d7. That we know from the periodic table. When argon, uh, when cobalt become cobalt 2, these two electrons will be lost and you get argon 3d7. Yeah. But when this is cobalt 3, for, uh, for the sake of discussion, if cobalt become cobalt 3, then it will lose these two electrons and one more from here. And cobalt 3 will be 3D6 and so on and so forth. So question 1 asks you to write the electron configuration of the cobalt ion, which is argon 3D6, 7, sorry, argon 3D7. And then B, question B asks you to use the valence bond theory to determine whether COCl4 2 minus has a square planar or tetrahedral geometry. How do you determine that? You determine that by using this information. Three unpaired electron, both the cobalt, either in here or in here, both of them have three unpaired electrons. So you can use this information to determine the hybridization of your cobalt in cobalt Cl4 2 minus. Yeah, so you for you look at this uh, complex ion. It is a cobalt with a coordination number of equal to four. Why four? Because you only have four ligands. So coordination number is four. So. When with coordination number of equal to four, there are two possibilities. Either you have a tetrahedral arrangement or a square planar arrangement. Yeah. Either a tetrahedral arrangement or square planar arrangement. And we know that square planar is DSP2 hybridized. Tetrahedral is SP3 hybridized. So we test for both. If you have a situation where it is uh, square planar, you put the four pairs of lone electrons in here, D, S, P, 2, and you are only left with four orbitals to fill in seven 
the electrons. So when you have to do that, you are filling it one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you have one unpaired electron. So that is not what you're looking for because the information that you have is that this particular species has three unpaired electrons. So let us try the tetrahedral arrangement. So tetrahedral is sp3. So you put your electrons in one in the s and the 3p. So you are left with 5d orbitals to be filled in with seven electrons. So seven electron goes like this. One, two, three, four, and five, six, and seven. So you have three unpaired electrons. So this is your answer. So from that, from that information, you can suggest that your compound here is a tetrahedral arrangement, not square planar. Because square planar will give you only one unpaired electron. Tetrahedron will give you three unpaired electrons. So I hope that is clear to you. From the number of unpaired electrons in cobalt Cl4 to minus, which is three unpaired electrons, it can be deduced from the drawings above that it has tetrahedral geometry with sp3 hybrid orbitals. So that's your answer. And then question uh, two, C2. It asks again, determine the hybridization of the um, orbitals in the pink complex ion cobalt water 62. So again, you have a look at how many ligands. Having six ligands mean that it is uh, octahedral. Octahedral is either DSP2 or SP2 and uh, D. D2 sp3 or sp3 d2. Yeah, like I explained previously. So you can try sp, uh, d, uh, uh, oh, you can try low spin complex giving you dsp3 d hybridization, only one unpaired electrons, not what you want. You try high spin complex. One, two, three, seven electrons like that. And you have hybridization of SP3D2 situation. So your cobalt water six is a high spin complex. So the correct arrangement for getting three unpaired electrons is the high spin arrangement as shown in the working above. Therefore, the hybridization of the pink complex is SP3D2. Then it says, draw the CFSE for both complex ion, include the distribution of the D electrons in the drawing. You already know that high spin, high spin means, high spin means big, no, no, small, small delta oct. High spin is in this situation. You fill up. One, two, three, four, five, and then six and seven. So you have three unpaired electrons. But for your COCl4, it is um, tetrahedral like this, where you have the EG at the bottom, T2G at the top. So seven electrons is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. You have three unpaired electrons. Yeah. Now, come to the color. From the color of the complexes, you are required to explain which one absorbs the component of light with a longer wavelength. Absorbs means you want to see the size of delta. Yeah, because energy absorbed is to jump that delta. Yeah, absorbed. So, you want to know which one has the smaller crystal field splitting, you need to work out what is delta. So you, you try and um, uh, build this kind of table, your complex of cobalt H2062 plus is pink. Your complex of cobalt Cl42 minus is blue. So we know 
pink has a longer wavelength. Remember, this is reflected, not absorbed. Reflected, what we see in our eyes. So, pink absorbs a longer wavelength because pink is close to red. Red is 700. Blue is closer to ultraviolet. And blue is shorter wavelength. So, longer wavelength is transmitted. That means absorbed wavelength must be shorter. When shorter wavelength is transmitted, that means absorbed wavelength is longer. So, if you check the color chart, pink has a complementary color of green. Blue has a complementary color of orange. So, shorter delta absorbed means it's big splitting because energy is inversely proportional to delta wavelength. So, short delta absorbed means big energy absorbed. Long delta absorbed means small energy absorbed. So, small energy absorbed is weak field ligand. Big energy absorbed is strong field ligand. So, comparatively, chloro is weak field compared to water. So, chloro is the weaker field ligand. Water is your stronger field ligand. So, on the reflected light, pink is longer wavelength, it is strong, uh, caused by strong field ligand. Blue, the reflected for COCl4, is a shorter, shorter lambda, produced by weak field ligand. Yep. What happens in, in between here is like a working, working, the thinking, process of thinking. So you come with the right conclusion. So, cobalt water 6 is colored pink, indicating it reflects a longer wavelength. Therefore, it can be deduced that it absor absorbs the component of light in short wavelength associated with big lambda caused by strong field ligand. COCl4 is colored blue, indicating it reflects short wavelength. That means it absorbs long wavelength associated with small lambda caused by weak field ligand. Yep. And you must also remember that tetrahedral complex is bound to have small delta compared to octahedral complex. Yeah. So, I hope you, you follow that lecture. It is slightly berputabili, it gets slightly twisted, twisted, but if you follow the argument, you will be fine. Okay? I hope uh, this is one of my longest lectures. It's 58 minutes. So that's it. Um, if you can't finish it in one go, you stop and you relax and you come back to this because this is luckily a recording. So you can uh, watch it in two parts if your brain is all sizzled up. So that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'll see you in my next lecture, which is lecture 18. Take care. Keep safe. Assalamualaikum.